Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we explore the latest in blockchain technology and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. In this episode, we catch up with Raul Jordan to talk about his recent article on the Libra blockchain, as well as a new fresh update on ETH2 developments. Before we start, we want to say thank you to this week's sponsor, Aragon One. If you love working with talented designers building smart user interfaces, or if you're simply excited about working on making DAOs easy and accessible to create and manage, then you should check out Aragon One's available jobs. The company is currently hiring a front-end engineer to help build the platform for modern organizations. For more about the front-end engineering role or available jobs in general, check out aragon.one slash jobs. That's A-R-A-G-O-N dot O-N-E slash jobs. So thank you again, Aragon One. And now here's our interview with Raul Jordan. So today we're inviting back Raul Jordan from Prismatic Labs to the podcast to give us a little bit of an update about ETH 2.0 and the work that they've been doing. Hi, Raul. Hey, Anna. How's it going? <laughs> good. How are you? Good, good. And as always, we also have Frederick here. Hello. So I think, Raul, since you've already been on the show, so we actually had a full episode, I think, last August with um, Prismatic Labs. But something we've started to ask guests when they arrive on the show, it's a little bit different than what we were doing back then, was not what have you been doing or what got you into this, but rather why did you get into this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, just a very brief background for those that are not familiar uh, with our work. So Prismatic Labs is a team working on a E2.0 client uh, called Prism. We're building everything in Go. Uh, my background is I'm a Go developer. Uh, I've been working with the team since early last year. And uh, yeah, so far we've been pretty much started out building out sharding and eventually went full on into the whole ETH 2.0 effort. Uh, so a bit of background, I was uh, I was pretty much uh, before this, I was working on a web 2.0 startup. Right? Um, I came from a world of full stack uh, web development uh, and, you know, have been learning Go for a while as well and was just extremely curious about what are the what are the most important entry points for people to contribute to ETH. Um, at the time, there was a sharding FAQ that Vitalik had out there. Very few people were working on it. Uh, it was essentially just a just a write up, um, and there was a lot of buzz around like how to scale ETH, but nobody really uh, taking on that layer one uh, that layer one implementation. So we started voicing around the message on on you know on Reddit and a few different forums. I came across my co-founder Preston Van Loon, uh, and we assembled a team of other open source developers, and we just started you know hacking away. Um, I think that was just like extremely motivating to know that, hey, there's a really big unsolved problem that there are people willing to support um, and people willing to also give guidance on from the research standpoint and also from the implementation standpoint. Um, we just sought out to build it out, you know, in the beginning as a volunteer effort and gradually evolved into something that we're excited to do full time now. I think that's a great way to get into something as well, by the way, to, to sort of look at the project and, and think to yourself where where can we have the most impact and like where can we make the biggest difference rather than you know what's the latest thing people are working on or like trying to write a trend um but i'm curious when you started that work on sharding and all this stuff did you imagine that it was going to be multiple teams working on something and that you know you're going to work closely with the research team at the EF and and all of this stuff or was it more like I think we can come up with a solution here and like propose that. Uh, definitely not. the the re The way it started was actually more of like one of the many parallel effort, efforts going on in Ethereum. So at the time, there was a lot of buzz, especially around Plasma, uh, State Channels, other Layer Two solutions, and um, it it just felt like one more vertical in the whole Ethereum uh, hub and spoke model. There wasn't really a unified ETH two point effort. Like this is a major upgrade that we're all going to team up with and kind of put our hands together to figure out it was more like hey we're just building out sharding which at the time seemed like a very uh very constrained aspect uh, now it's become a full-on effort for sure so i think we want to spend most of this episode talking about updates about prismatic and eth 2.0 but before we start into that 
One of the reasons that I reached out to you recently to come back on the show was actually due to something quite different. Uh, you had written an article where you did a technical deep dive into the Libra stack. This is Facebook's Libra cryptocurrency project. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of I'm kind of curious, maybe to start this part of the conversation out. Why did you do that? Um, yeah, so the reason I went into Libra was just because really, you know, building out uh, building out an implementation effort such as E2 is can be a little bit disorganized. And, you know, there is no central project management. Every team kind of is on their own in terms of how they implement things and how what design decisions they're undertake. Um, whereas Facebook obviously has a very strong team of PMs, has a very strong, uh, you know, set of engineers that kind of understand industry best practices and have a set of company guidelines and a playbook to build things out. Uh, we wanted to understand kind of how their design decisions and like um, affected their final implementation, understand kind of how like an industry giant is able to, you know, put their engineering expertise to build out something like this and see how we can compare it to other implementation efforts in the crypto space. Um, specifically ours, so we've been, you know, we're, we've been very curious to see, you know, how kind of they stack up to other projects. Um, so yeah, we were just curious about their code, um, see how they build stuff out and see how things get built out from a centralized organization. What stood out to you when you were doing this deep dive? I think we were very impressed by uh, the quality of some of the design decisions that they took. So Typically, you know, they they chose technologies just because they know they're proven and they work and and they've been they've been in production for a while. So, as an example, the Libra project uses uh, this uh, this RPC thing called gRPC, which is a project developed by Google that lets you kind of enable uh, you know server to server communication and uh, querying information. So, it essentially helps you establish the API of a node. Um, we opt to use gRPC as well because it's been in production, at, you know, at so many other companies in the world, especially at Google. Uh, whereas many other, you know, we notice that a lot of other teams in the space are actually advocating against that. They're advocating for creating our own solution and kind of going our own way. Um, so we've been kind of in the middle of this debate of like, should we be using tools that are, you know, that that exist and are in production out there, or does ETH need specific technologies to ETH, right? Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to understand how we can leverage the best things uh, for the job. Um, so looking at that, you know, we noticed that they they uh, they follow a lot of the similar reasoning, of course. Um, and we wanted to understand kind of some of the things that they did do differently um, and kind of what that looked like. I think that's a, an eternal discussion in engineering, right? And it is interesting to see how different you know, companies and projects approach different things. ETH has a lot of these discussions around, you know, networking and how do we do not only RPC, but general like message construction and, and um, compression and serialization. And it has its own serialization libraries and, and a bunch of things that, you know, at the end of the day, you, you can always make something that's slightly better. You can always make something that's, you know, given that we know this domain and we can customize it to this, or we know that this type of data will be more common than that. And therefore we can have a serialization, blah, blah, blah. You end up with these constantly having to make these trade-offs of either we can use something standardized or we can build something completely custom and it's slightly better. The question is, does that right. slightly betterness actually matter at the end of the day or not? And yeah, I can imagine uh, an organization would opt more on the side of let's just use what exists and get something out there. Right. Another thing that we were looking at was, you know, we obviously the Libra project spent, uh, I'd say, probably the most of their time surveying the crypto landscape to see what tools they could use that have already been built, uh, perhaps in designing their programming language, thinking about their consensus protocol, thinking about how they're going to do P2P networking. Um and, you know, we were just curious if, like, they were going to leverage anything that ETH has built over the years, like any of the ideologies or technologies that have been built. Uh, so we were just looking at it from that angle. Um, I think after that, we started getting curious about, okay, what is this going to look like from an end user standpoint? Are end users going to be able to replicate the whole Libra chain? And I think that's what led uh, to the creation of the article, right? Like understanding what are their motivations and does Libra's code align with the intentions of Facebook with building this project? Um, that was the main question we were asking as we were uh, writing out the article. Hmm. What was, what do you think was kind of missing from their design? 
Yeah, actually, so looking more at their code, although they, they've been choosing some very good technologies for the job, um, it, a lot of things are actually missing. Um, it's definitely, I would say it's definitely not not close to production. They're missing so many important pieces of kind of a, the Node API, uh, what information they're exposing. Right now, it's it seems like it's mostly like a kind of like something you can try out and just mess around with. So you can you can essentially create an account. You can create a with their internal wallet that's built into the client. Um, you can essentially uh, mint some Libra based on a faucet that they give you. You can send Libra coin to other people in the network. You can query specific account information and specific transaction information, uh, but you can't really do much more than that, right? Um, they also put a lot more effort into kind of making sure that you can compile their move programming language for smart contracts. Uh, but aside from that, you can't really do much. I mean, you can't really deploy into 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 their test net. You can't do as much. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me was that essentially we don't even know if the data uh, we receive from their testnet is is trustworthy. Basically, they give us this Libra endpoint. So something like Libra.endpoint.com or something like, like API.Libra.com. Um, and you can request chain information, you can request account information, and they give it to you. Uh, but we're not actually peering with that node. We're not actually getting getting the chain data and transaction data as it comes along. So, you know, it's essentially a black box at this point. We don't really know what's going on. What was your impression of the move language and their VM? Um, the move language, it, it, it does have some interesting decisions around primitives. So by primitives, I mean, like, how do we represent the unit of the unit of currency, the unit of of a coin in the in the language? Uh, their whole paradigm is that, you know, like Ether and Ethereum in particular in Solidity has uh, has quite complicated ways to represent kind of uh, numbers and how to represent uh, like the unit values of ETH and, and GUI values. Um, in the move programming language, they focus a lot on like, they want to make their programming language around moving coins around basically, right? That's the origin of the name. They want to make sure that there's a very strong core primitive for like one coin in the system, uh, making sure it's properly handled, has a lot of good helper functions and making it easier to kind of, uh, kind of, basically write smart contracts the way they're intended to, which is to essentially send and transact information between parties. Uh, they want to prevent a lot of these a lot of these bugs that typically arise in Solidity code uh, due to the nature of the language uh, by having kind of stronger and tighter control around the primitives. That's one thing that we noticed. Um, and yeah, it seems like it's still obviously in its early stages. What, what project already in the wild is it closest to? Is it closest to Ethereum, do you think? Um, I would say, I would say it's, it, 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 I don't think it is in particular. Um, I don't know if I have one particular to compare it to. One thing that Libra is, is fortunate to have is that they don't have to operate under the constraint of handling millions of validators, right? Uh, they only have mm -hmm. to worry about handling a handful of authenticated, like privileged validators, right? So that makes a lot of your assumptions simpler. It makes it a lot more scalable by default. Uh, you don't have to worry about kind of uh, the things that we have to worry about in Ethereum. Like we want anyone to be able to become a validator if you have 32 Ether. And this comes at a very big uh, consequence around uh, kind of uh, like verifying signatures, like without having fancy signature schemes like BLS, which is what we have. Uh, it makes it a lot harder to reason about, uh, you know, it makes it a lot harder to design uh, strong and robust uh, consensus models. So they're lucky that they don't have to worry about those things, um, and they have a lot, a lot simpler uh, consensus paradigm. I'm just thinking, actually, what you described sort of in the the beginning there when you started talking about Libra, you talk about this this team and sort of the way that they can make their decisions, and I think that's actually good framing for today's episode, which is going to be more about ETH 2.0 and like where it's at. Because, I mean, in a way, do you, do you feel like? Do you think because of their very, very centralized nature, I mean, I think this is kind of obvious, but like because of their very, very centralized nature, they were able to just like make very sharp decisions very quickly? Absolutely. I think it comes at a downside that you, you like the engineers themselves implementing may not have as much of a say in, um, in, in a lot of these decisions. So in ETH2, when we come across a problem, uh, we spend quite a lot of time deliberating among the teams along probably best practices, whether we should approach it in certain ways. Um, and we usually end up either changing our mind or uh, or just learning a lot about, you know, different perspectives of how to do things. Um, you know, it, Facebook also is lucky that the Libra project right now only pretty much is only has one official supported implementation in Rust. 
Um, mm. There are some things that, you know, in E2, we have many different clients in Go and Python and different languages. Uh, one design that one decision that you might take in a Rust project uh, might not translate very well to a Go project. Um, so, you know, you need to have this very kind of this very decentralized process of figuring out the best way of solving a problem. Whereas these guys, they they can just do it, you know, um, they can just go along and do it. Uh, but obviously that comes with the downside. So what was your kind of final takeaway from the Libra review that you did? Based on the code and kind of uh, the way everything is written in their repo, it seems to allude that users will not be able to replicate the entire state machine. So that is that I won't be able to run a node, peer with other nodes and sync the entire chain and receive incoming transactions and blocks as they happen. Um, actually, the Libra team responded to kind of to my tweet storm about that. And they mentioned that it is on the horizon, and that's one of their biggest kind of uh, kind of their big, biggest plans moving forward. However, looking at the specifics of their response and their blog post, it seems like they will they will still not provide a way for users to sync. It seems like instead they're going to provide some API from some node endpoint that you can then receive some state or chain information, right? Uh, so why this is not exactly the best is that you still have to trust kind of this endpoint. You still have to trust this like api.libra.com URL sending you the right data. Um, and, you know, from my understanding, I don't really see much incentive for validators that pay $10 million a seat to kind of allow external peers to sync with them, mm. right? I mean, they're, they don't have to do that. It's not, it's not in their best in interest or best incentive to do so. Um, so overall, it seems like the Libra project still might not make uh, might not make the blockchain accessible to end users as they would want to. It's also one of these questions of like, it's it's sort of promised, but once something's live with like actual users and like you mentioned, like companies who've paid a lot of money to be to be part of it, even if theoretically it might have made sense in the early stages at this, you know, at the time that it's actually supposed to be implemented this way, it wouldn't actually be able to be due to sure. all sorts yeah, of can things. Imagine, yeah. I can imagine maybe there's a api.libra.com or there's a libra.visa.com endpoint and you might want to get some chain information and you might just be, you know, you're, they might tell you like, oh, you're rate limited or, oh, you can't access that piece of information. You yeah. know, that's totally, can totally happen. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't happen. So. Doing a little bit of update on you guys and, and what you've been up to in the past years. Yeah. What's the latest with Prismatic Labs? Sure. Yeah. Last time we spoke, last time we spoke, we were actually on the brink of releasing a very local kind of simulation of ETH2. So you can basically launch a local chain in your computer. You can test it out. You can see the chain advancing and kind of, you know, people producing blocks locally. Um, since then, it's been a whirlwind. We've been focusing a lot on a public testnet release for phase zero. What this means is that we wanted a public permissionless kind of accessible testnet where anyone can use some testnet ether. So something from the Gorley testnet, um, uh, deposit 32 ether and basically become an ETH2 validator. So you're, you're basically assigned to propose blocks, to vote on blocks. Um, and you can, you can, you know, you do your job and you earn rewards or accrue penalties based on your behavior. So it, it was a very big milestone for us uh, because we wanted to make sure this nest testnet was as open as possible. We wanted to give people a feel of what the real thing could be like. Uh, and we consider it a, a success. Uh, we've had uh, we've had uh, test nets that we didn't expect to last long, to last for several weeks. Um, we've had a lot of bug fixes due to this, a lot of interesting people coming on board and just asking, Hey, can we contribute to ETH2? Can we build maybe a dashboard to visualize my staking rewards? Um, is there a better way to display this? So really just iterating on this user feedback is so invaluable, especially when they have almost full autonomy of, uh, running their own node and having the ability to interact with this. Um, we actually ended up not running as many nodes ourselves. Uh, most of the nodes on our testnet actually were run from the outside, uh, which was fairly interesting. What's the oh, name of nice. your testnet? Yeah, it was called the Sapphire testnet. So uh, I can share the link with you, uh, but it's uh, Al it's you can look it up on uh, prylabs.net, and that should give you the uh, that should give you the the access to the testnet. This may be going to be a little bit of a basic question here, yeah. but does each client have to have their own testnet, or could clients share that? 
Definitely at the moment, ours is only single client. The reason being is that, you know, every team is on kind of a different timeline and working on different aspects of, of the project. The main goal definitely okay. is to have a multi-client testnet, right? That's closer to what we really need and what we're going to have in production. So ours was just really uh, kind of a proof of concept of the work we've been doing over the months coming leading up to it. Um, I don't think it's that critical to have right now. I think right now every team is focused on interop. and Going on back multi- to one thing you mentioned there of like moving ether from a te- like some other test net to start staking with it does that mean you've implemented all the bridge stuff there as well that's right so just a quick recap for those unfamiliar on how kind of uh, the eth2 onboarding works um say that you have right now 32 ether well there's going to be a specific smart contract deployed on the eth1 chain called the deposit contract um where you can send that ether to the contract uh, along with some other parameters, you can launch one of our nodes and one of our nodes will basically pick up that the deposit happened and you'll be onboarded as a validator on ETH2. It's essentially a one-way uh, one uh, deposit, so you can't get it back on the original chain. It's basically locked in there forever. Um, and then, yeah, so that's we implemented that whole process. We wanted to have the thing as close to the real uh, scenario as possible. That's cool. How how is the that bridge done on? Like, how do you detect that the deposit has happened and and register it? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. We just subscribe to log events from ETH one nodes, and there's a, there's a smart contract address where deposits go to. So it's it's pretty pretty straightforward to do that. There are some concerns that have been raised recently, like with respect to having this, uh, like you know, in the case of a reorg or in the case of something being attacked. Like, how do you ensure that deposits you know make it there with integrity? Um, that's still that's still kind of an open domain, uh, but overall it works decently well. So, who needs to run the ETH one nodes? The ETH one nodes. Uh, well, right now we use the Gorley testnet, so that's uh, that's the public uh, proof of authority testnet that's been out there since ETH Berlin. Um, so we just use that actually in production. It's going to be the real ETH one point chain. Uh, you can point it out to any node uh, in Fura. You can run your own node. Uh, as long as you're synced with the chain. Yeah, but that so that that's what I mean. Like you need to sync with the chain, and then like your software subscribes to log events on that node. But right. then, right? How does like there has to be some sort of oracle thing or like a quorum of validators that say yes, this log actually happened before anything can happen on on the ETH two chain, right? That's right. I think there is also a, a small. There's also a delay of time between kind of when deposits get filled up in the contract, and then there is basically a, um, there's basically like a, a initiation of a validator. So it's a pretty long period of time. So the way it works is that there's something called an ETH one follow distance. So essentially, a thousand twenty four blocks have to pass by uh, before we can even consider looking at a deposit. So essentially, there's this like sliding window uh, of availability in which you can verify that a deposit did happen. Hmm. So it take it takes a long time, right? Yeah. Um, and if you see that your peers have seen a deposit and you haven't, uh, well, you know maybe something's going on. Um, in particular, for launching the chain itself, uh, there will be a delay uh, based on the deposit threshold of validators. So we're gonna let the deposit contract fill up with deposits, and once it reaches a certain level, then uh, basically the genesis event is gonna trigger, um, and that's gonna also it's good. There's going to be a short delay from when it fills up to when it happens to ensure that clients have enough time to catch up to the chain. Mm. Right. So back to that point you made before, like right now, if somebody, I guess right now everything's still on a test net, but like once phase zero ETH 2.0 is live, which mm-hmm. as far as I understand, it is not yet. Right? Not yet. Okay. But once that's live, if you wanted to start staking you could actually do that or validating rather you could start doing that but would you need to like would you individually need to be running a node on eth1 and then do this process or will there be any tools to help like kind of the average user do this absolutely absolutely it all comes down to kind of your kind of your your security and your your personal uh level of security and uh, kind of what you want uh how much control you want over the system uh, I assume a lot of average users might just want to see gains on their deposit. So they might not care as much about running their full kind of ETH node. They might not care about running their full even ETH 2.0 node. Um, I imagine, you know, there will be services that allow you to kind of run a validator either as a validator as a service, or you can connect to some ETH2 node where you can just uh, send kind of signing information or send blocks to and kind of earn rewards. So it all comes down to kind of your personal preference of how much you want to trust others versus 
do everything yourself. Uh, we imagine that it will be the case that most people will be using these services to just gain uh, gain interest on their deposits. I think we did in previous episodes touch on the phases. Um, yeah. Maybe we can just cover again what they are. So phase zero Absolutely. is the one that's coming up really soon, as far as I understand. And that's what you're testing right now with your test net. Yeah, phase zero is coming up very soon. There's a tentative date of January 3rd, 2020. Um, however, there's a lot of things that need to happen before that date. In particular, we care about having a multi-client test set, right? That's the real test. That's when we're really going to know, like, can this hold up in production? Uh, the goal is to have that around DevCon. Um, and that's going to be a really exciting time for the Ethereum community as a whole. Um, the next big thing is phase one. So what phase one means is that we're going to have shards and we're going to have data on these shards. So essentially, we're going to partition the chain into partition the state of Ethereum into 1024 shards where, uh, you know, these are going to be uh, validators are going to be assigned to validate on particular shards. And basically, the whole network will have the same security pool. That in particular will not have smart contract functionality. So it's only around sharding and setting up the structure of the shards. Um, it's mostly a networking problem. So being able to make sure that we can efficiently route traffic across these shards, make sure validators are participating correctly. So, but there won't be much change from phase zero, right? Uh, for phase two, that's when the real thing happens. And I think that's when we can get closer to saying that we have a real smart contract platform called E2. Uh, then you can actually execute smart contracts. So that's uh, that's when you can actually run code. You can actually modify the state. Uh, you know, kind of send send uh, send ether from one person to another. So that's a lot closer to what we see today. Um, and that's uh, that's the phase two. Uh, beyond that, there's a lot of other improvements, but that's mostly everything that's on the horizon at the moment. So just to summarize or to sort of repeat what I think it is mm -hmm. from what you've said, it's phase zero is like you can validate and you can actually earn some block reward something, um, but you can't, like nothing's really happening. You're just basically putting yeah. it somewhere. It's not really securing anything. It's just sort of practicing the validation. <laughs> Phase one, you introduce the shards. So then there are actually like this sharded blockchain proof of stake, but still you'd only, I guess, be able to transfer like, funds, you're not going to necessarily be able to do anything that Ethereum can do in terms of smart contracting. That's right. You won't be able to execute. Yeah. yeah. And then phase two is where you start to actually have the full-fledged ETH uh, functionality, but on this ETH 2.0 chain. That's right. So for phase zero, we have a spec freeze. I think that was 0 0.8, if I recall correctly, right. was frozen. Yep. And that means sort of no new features go in but things are still being improved bugs are ironed out whatever uh but like this is what it's supposed to be uh how far along are you in implementing this how far far along do you see everyone else like the community as a whole being to implementing this and like you said the true test is the multi client test net but are there things in that are not in the spec that would actually be a requirement to move to that not having a spec freeze, I think, was the biggest deterrent to building a production client. Uh, you know, you can't just you can't just commit to uh, long term designs if things are going to change kind of underneath you. So that was, I think, one of the most exciting days of this year. What this means for everyone is that now we have a very solid place to make to you know build our work from and know that it's not going to change in non trivial manners. Uh, right now, the spec is up to version 0 0.8.1. And the cool thing is that the researchers have been putting a lot of focus on these things called conformity tests. So essentially, they create a bunch of very, like very, very big test files uh, of just raw data that we can then run through our clients and make sure that they output the right result. So what this means is that we know that, you know, our team gets the same result as the Python research team gets the same result as Lighthouse, which is building in a Rust and all the other teams. So having this is really critical because once we do multi-client testing, we'll know that if there's a bug, it's not because of our core code, but it's because of some issue in our runtime or in our client itself, right? Um, what this means is that, yeah, essentially we implement the same protocol as uh, Lighthouse does or as, uh, as the E2 research team does. That's been a lot of the focus. We are fully compliant with version 0 0.8.1, which is the latest one. We pass all the conformity tests. And I know a lot of the other teams are getting very close to that. 
that point as well. Uh, in terms of things that are not in the spec is networking. Networking is the biggest kind of elephant in the room. Uh, there is a, there's a lot to talk about in terms of compliance and making sure that we can communicate between clients appropriately and have a standard. Um, and kind of that comes back to the earlier discussion about how do you how do you make decisions in this decentralized uh, kind of environment, right? Where everyone kind of has different languages to tackle um, and and different clients. So it's been it's been quite a journey. I think a lot of the teams are becoming a lot more familiar with working together. Um, they're doing a lot of different retreats together, you know, kind of meeting up in person. And there's a lot more collaboration at this point in time. So that's been really great. Um, and I think at this point, there's nothing really holding us back from getting closer to the multi-client testnet and eventually production. I definitely I want to come back to networking later because, I mean, we've heard that come up in a few different contexts and the challenges around that. Um, but before we do that, I kind of want to hear a bit more about what it is to be an implementer and to work on a spec. Like, were you guys part of the building of the spec? I, I'm just, I'm sort of curious how the research team and you guys worked together before the spec was frozen and if that's changed now. Um, the the way we worked together before the spec was frozen, really was, uh, you know, we, we were just very careful about the changes we would make. Uh, we would contribute to bug fixes or suggestions on the specs repo. So maybe like, maybe somebody on the research side would propose a change and we'd be like, hey, maybe this might not be very good on the go side, it might be pretty tough to implement. Is there another way? Uh, and then we'd go through several rounds of feedback and get that merged in. So we'd mostly collaborate that way, we'd contribute a little bit to the spec. But a lot of the research discussions were kind of, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're not as plugged into, right? So mm -hmm. the researchers definitely spent a lot of time on their own, kind of coming up with a lot of the, a lot of the decisions, uh, and then we retroactively look at them and help out or provide feedback. Um, one of the things that they're very interested in is performance. So that's the only, that's one of the things where we contribute a lot. So we're like, hey, you know, we implemented this part of the spec. It actually ends up being very slow or it ends up being very fast. So that helps the researchers have a better understanding of how to write, how to write the spec. Um, moving forward, I think mostly they they care a lot about, uh, kind of coordinating and multi-client testing. So we're working a lot on conformity and making sure that all the teams are aligned on the same goals and ideas making sure that nobody, you know, that everyone has their concerns voiced. I think that's the role of the researchers at the moment moving forward. Um, and I know Vitalik in particular has been putting a lot of time on phase one and moving forward, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very exciting time ahead. I could almost throw the same question at you, Frederick. <laughs> what's, it, what's it like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we've taken... Uh... I think an interesting thing in this space is all the implementation teams seem to take a lot of different approaches. We've gone much more of the way that Raul was talking about. Um, initially, we were very passively just following the spec and sometimes even not implementing the spec because we knew it was going to be changed again and just kind of going along and then providing more and more feedback. And uh, we've never like been involved in the research itself. It's just, I don't, I don't know that any team has except maybe the consensus team who actually got like three or four researchers yeah. you know working actively only on the research part i don't know it's interesting to see a lot of these different teams most i would say are just sort of following the research team providing feedback here and there and i'm curious now as well like once the spec is frozen now what's what's going to happen and something like we'll get back to the networking part but something i see there for instance is that it's not something that the research team is all that interested in. And so it's it's a little bit more up to the implementers and then the dynamic shifts a little bit. You can't just follow someone. Yeah, that's why we're doing, I think, a lot of more in-person gatherings and really ironing things out together. Um, in particular, like, you know, how do we how do we use existing technologies? So there's this awesome uh, tool called libp 2 p from Protocol Labs. Um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a project that, might not fit the exact needs of ETH2. So there have been a lot of complaints regarding like, you know, like how, how you know, uh, standardization across different languages. Like right now there's only one Go implementation and one Rust implementation that's uh, that's like, that's in use. Uh, other teams are building out different implementations in it, such as the JS one. Um, but overall, you know, we, we need to make sure we collaborate with Protocol Labs, which is an entirely different effort than Ethereum to make sure that we can use their tool for ETH2. Uh, even coming up with our own entire networking uh, kind of library, which is uh, this project called Hobbits that's been going around. 
Um, so overall, you know, we're still exploring options. I think uh, I think the teams are a lot more ready to hmm. kind of begin uh, taking this seriously and implementing it if necessary. I think maybe just to sort of break it down, where does this networking happen? What does it look like? Um, as I mentioned before, most of the teams have initially started implementing or using libp2p, which is the protocol labs library. The thing about libp2p is that it attempts to be this like big one-size-fits-all networking library for peer-to-peer -peer communications. Uh, and obviously, that may not go perfectly for something like ETH2. Uh, you know, there might we've encountered there's a lot of memory usage. Uh, we've found some bugs that we really in our testnet that we believe can we can attribute to lit P2P itself. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of problems from trying to be too general. Uh, whereas you know, there's been discussions about making something that's very ETH2 specific, like the current ETH 1.0 um, kind of implementation has this thing called Dev P2P. Uh, Frederick Frederick knows a lot more about this than I do, of course. Um, but you know it's been around for a while, and it's it's kind of very specific to ETH2. Uh, I believe it uses RLP encoding, right? Which is the serialization. Uh, yeah. Library. Yeah. So so you know there's some talks about okay, how can we build something that's trimmed down specific for ETH2, or should we continue kind of dealing with uh, the the kind of the quirks and issues that lib P2P has and fixing those, right? Um, that's the current point of discussion. I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about before with the Libra stuff and like where do you make your trade-offs and, and how do you make your trade-offs dev p2p is specific to eth1 and that's been both good and bad I and mean, it means that there's no existing tools for it there's no knowledge about how it works there's so many projects that try to connect to the chain or get get you know scrape information from nodes or do this or that thing and they basically can't. And we have all these really shitty solutions around Ethereum for, you know, doing things because the networking code is so hard to deal with. Whereas if you had something generic, then with, with lots of tools available, you get all the niceties of that, but you get the extra overhead like you were talking about of having something that's too generic. Um, so it's really not an easy trade-off to make. Yeah, it seems like one of the paths moving forward would be to just work a lot closer with Protocol Labs. So the team lead for that is Raul Kripalani from uh, the Lead P2P team. He's been extremely awesome just coordinating with the ETH2 teams, making sure he answers questions. Um, and actually, I, think, I believe they're working on a grants initiative uh, to help build this collaboration between ETH, ETH2 and Protocol Labs. So they want to just really make this happen and make sure that uh, we, can, we can leverage the tool in the best way possible. I think a lot of the confusion comes from as well, just not knowing what libp2p really is, where I, I know I've talked to a lot of people who have a lot of co confusion around thinking that, oh, this is a specific protocol for doing networking, but it's not. It's like a meta protocol. It's a wrapper around like protocols in which you can implement multiple protocols and it, it enables this sort of upgrading and downgrading and, and handshaking of establishing, hey, you know, I'm pinging you and I'm asking you what what protocols do you speak? And then you can kind of do this negotiation and come to the conclusion that we both speak the ETH1 protocol and then you speak ETH1 protocol with each other after that. So you can still implement right. anything you want, but you have to have that initial like handshaking stuff for, for it to be libp2p. So it's really just that's that right. like meta protocol stuff that's, that's libp2p. So you're not buying into one, like one discovery algorithm, and then maybe that discovery algorithm doesn't work for you. It's not really at that level. Yep, exactly. Why wasn't this something that would have been kind of identified by the research team? Like, you know, there's, you sort of mentioned it's like once it, once the spec was frozen, and then you start doing the implementation, that's when this problem kind of arises. So do you think that the researchers had this idea that this, that libp2p would be some sort of catch all? There, I mean, I think, I think that was how it was initially framed. Um, obviously, the role of the spec should be very well scoped to just pure research around uh, the consensus and around how ETH2 should work deep down. Um, when it comes to details like networking and implementation details, they can make suggestions as to how they think it could be good. But I doubt the spec should include any 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 strong information or strong suggestions to implementers about that. Um, yeah, it was initially framed as that. I mean, it's 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 it, it, the project has been in, in development for a long time. Uh, it's I mean, the project itself poses itself as a very 
kind of generic uh, toolkit for building peer-to-peer -peer communications. I would mirror Raul's um, statement here as well, uh, but just say as well that like the, I don't think the research team had any idea of what networking would be when they set out to do so. Like lib B2B wasn't on the horizon. I think our first sharding meetup was in February 2017, maybe somewhere around there in Taiwan. And um, lib P2P was just being brought up then as like, this is something that exists out there. Maybe it's worth looking at. So yeah, it, it, it's one of those things that when you're working on a spec, you kind of just go, oh, this is an implementation detail. Like it doesn't really matter. And uh, right. it doesn't really matter to the spec, but to the impl implementers, it obviously matters a lot. There's nothing that says you have to have a cross-client network that, that all nodes can talk to each other. It's sort of a weird concept that it's obviously extremely desirable, <laughs> But it's not a requirement for this to actually work, especially That's not right. in ETH1, um, where, you know, as long as you can process blocks from another client, there's no no reason that you have to appear directly to them. Uh, so you, you could have like bridge nodes that just relay those blocks between the two networks. And I mean, you could come up with all sorts of crazy ideas, but but it gets so fucking complicated and weird if you don't say that they all speak the same networking protocol. Um, so it's, it, it's one of those things that it doesn't belong in the spec, but everyone needs to agree on the, on the same thing just for the sake of sanity. That actually kind of flows into this question that, that we wanted to talk about, which is like the decision-making you sort of mentioned this. And again, going back to that comment about Libra and how decision-making would happen there. I mean, how are you sort of mentioned that you're doing a lot of retreats and stuff, but how are standards or decisions actually being taken now that the specs are frozen? Is there still sort of like a project lead? Is there like, how, how is that happening? Yeah, overall, I think so. Uh, you know, Danny Ryan puts a lot of work to really help coordinate. Um, recently, Proto Lambda from the from the E2 research team has been doing a lot of work to help the teams make sure that they're up to speed on the test and the conformity. Uh, but I mean, just because the spec is frozen doesn't mean we can't open issues or we can't open discussions in the specs repo. I mean, there's still a lot going on in there in particular. So I think uh, having this, dec this decentralized decision making and having uh, the different teams give their input is super helpful to us. So we were down the rabbit hole of implementing our serialization library in a specific way, and we really disagreed with one aspect of the spec. It turns out, you know, the different teams came in, they voiced their opinions, and we actually resolved it uh, really well. Uh, we ended up siding on siding on their uh, on their argument and really changing our mind on that subject. So having these issue threads on GitHub is really how we communicate um, and getting that across the board. We do have the bi-weekly implementer calls, but that's mostly for stand-up and making sure, you know, hey, what's everyone working on? How everything? How's everything going? And the researchers give us some insight into their decisions. Um, yeah, just because it's, the spec is frozen, I mean, we even even then we still have a lot of discussions and still a lot of improvements to make. It's also worth uh, reiterating that it's the phase zero spec right. that's frozen. <laughs> like phase one and two are still active, absolutely unknowns, kind of. Do you think because you are actually doing some of the implementation of phase zero, though, that is influencing then the phase one and phase two research? Is there a lot of kind of cross-pollination going on there? So at the moment, not really, actually. I think the phases okay. are pretty well scoped, you know. I think, uh, you know, the phase zero, I would say, is by far the most complex and the one that we really need to get right because it's the foundation for the whole system. Like if the consensus is broken, then, you know, shards are not going to work and smart contracts are not going to work. So this is probably the hardest thing that took a lot of work to nail down. Um, the rest are are going to be a little bit more open. Um, and 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 I, I, I wouldn't say the word easier, but... I, I would wager would require shorter research cycles to complete. I've definitely seen some desire to like involve more of the other phases in phase zero spec and like put in placeholders mm -hmm. for this or that thing that we expect mm -hmm. to be coming. And uh, I know, uh, especially I think Yasek from the status team has tweeted many times and just like been been very aggressive in trying to remove those references to other phases to like keep phase zero pure yeah. and keep it to just phase zero. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that because, uh, you know, like mentioning earlier, like phase zero, it, it's it's the foundation um, and essentially it includes some references to how shards are going to work. But, you know, like stubs, for example, like, oh, right now we're going to use empty shards to do phase one, you know, so we have that sort of things, those sort of things in place. Um, I do agree we should try to keep it more pure. Um, it just makes it easier to reason about and easier to verify. So, yeah. One of the comments that I've kind of heard repeatedly actually over the last year maybe like the last six months on twitter so this is like outside of the actual core teams working on this it's this idea that there are too many implementers um there's too many teams too many voices and i wonder what like i'd really almost like to just ask both of you to give us a sense of what it's really like because do you think that there are too many teams or too many voices or is this just sort of a twitter gossip rumor (laughs) thing (laughs) <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, so I'd say there are probably on the order of eight to nine teams. Um, my answer to the question is that each team has a very different focus and what they're building. So, for example, like the, the kind of the chain safe team building the Lodestar client in JavaScript has more of a focus on browsers and light clients. And, uh, you know, I think that's a very much needed aspect for E2. Uh, we, you know, the Prism, uh, the Prism project is targeting more of like the average validator, sort of like how, you know, running a Geth node today would be similar to running a Prism node in the future. That's what we, that's what we would aim to accomplish. Uh, Lighthouse team is focused a lot on performance and security and, uh, you know, kind of being a Rust project. Uh, so every team has really their own angle, right? And I think they all provide extremely valuable contributions, uh, both to the spec and implementation discussions. Um, I think we'll really see what happens after multi-client testnet. So that's when like really, you know, uh, like what's going to happen and who's going to be, which which clients are going to be the ones used the most. Um, and I think that's going to come down really to people's preferences and how they run and how fast they are, how secure they are, et cetera. Yeah, I think it goes back into what are you focusing on and what are you trying to achieve? Is it too many teams, you know, for what? For what goal? (laughs) For building the best possible spec in ETH2? No, like you can't have too many teams. Is it uh, the best setup for building something really quickly? No, absolutely not. There are definitely too many teams for building something really quickly. But, uh, you know, what is the goal? And and I think the everyone working on it and like some part of the community has a very different idea of what the goals are and how to get there than some other parts of the community. I think very, you know, likely it is on the investor side, especially larger investors, they have this old mindset of, you know, we invest in this company and then usually they even have some say or some push in how they work. And I like, no, you have to make an executive decision here, like make this today. And then tomorrow you start working on it. You can't just dilly dally around and like research this thing for six months. Right. Um, so I think a lot of it boils down to that. Like what, what's your goal and like too many or too few is, uh, has to relate to that goal. And I think there's, there's obviously a balance. You don't want to be on either end. Um, but I don't, I, it's certainly not like, we're not at the end of like, oh, there's so many teams that we're not going to get anything mm. done. It sounded like what, from what you guys are saying too, that it would like, as the phases, as it progresses, that there will be kind of a uh, pooling of talent around certain clients. Like, do you just imagine that some of these clients will just sort of decide not to do their own implementation, but rather just join another one? Right. I mean, I imagine there's repetition of languages and stuff happening here. Well, I I think we have to keep in mind that there's no incentive for actually building any of these things. And so at the end of the day, when you're there and you're launching a client, if it's not being used, why would you keep working on it? Yeah, but would you then join another one? Like, could you see these teams just sort of join together? I wouldn't see them merging code bases, but sure, like the team itself might move to someone to some other client yeah i mean i i would hope that that would be the case and that they want to continue their work and their passion in some other place but who knows <laughs> like the motivation be- be behind a lot of these teams is completely foreign to me i don't know why they're doing what they're doing <laughs> i think it's cool that they're doing it but i don't know why <laughs> i have a question about eth 2.0 
in if you look at the polka dot network there's something called substrate which allows you to like develop these sure. parachains really quickly uh so far i haven't really heard about an eth 2.0 substrate equivalent like would you are there going to be that is there a need to have a way to build shards yeah, so in ETH 2.0, shards are actually homogenous. So they're all pretty much exactly the same from the protocol standpoint. I mean, there's no, like, one shard is going to be have, have some sort of different have some sort of different logic or different things. Um, one of the things that is that I would say is akin to that is these things called execution environments. So this is getting into phase two, right? So a lot of the questions are like, hey, how are smart contracts going to work? How is code actually going to happen on ETH? on ETH 2.0, and there's been this talk about these things called threads or execution environments. The basic idea is that you can write up, you can you can basically code up uh, this kind of, uh, just think about it kind of like an operating environment, operating system, where has it has its own specific rules and its own specific constraints where you can develop programs on. So for example, you can formalize all of ETH 1.0 as an execution environment, and we can deploy that on, the ETH, on an ETH 2 shard. So I know that's like very meta and very, very high level, uh, but think about it like, for example, on ETH2, we're going to be able to kind of specify the entire ETH 1.0 blockchain and run that as an execution environment. You can maybe specify the entire Bitcoin UTXO model and specify that as an execution environment. Um, and every time you deploy a contract, you deploy it to one of these specific execution environments where then they run their logic accordingly to according to the rules and the gas costs and et cetera of their system. So that's the general idea. We want to make it pretty general. Um, we want to make it so that it can support all types of use cases. Um, yeah. Do those do those threads actually exist over multiple shards or on one shard? So the threads are actually going to be deployed. Their code is going to be deployed on the beacon chain, which is the mm -hmm. you can think about it as the coordinator or root shard uh, in a sense. Um, and essentially, shards will then you know shards are all homogenous. The only reason shards exist is for data availability and for partitions. So uh, that's essentially where account data and transaction data and information will go into. But essentially, they're all, they're all going to be running the code from uh, the, the, the execution environment code from the beacon chain. So back to that question, will there be like a substrate or a builder of some sort? I think there will have to yeah. be, but I think uh, substrate is a blockchain building framework. And it, it also has a framework and a set of tools and libraries for writing runtimes. But it like substrate as a whole is like networking and databases and consensus and all these other things. But that's what all of these different teams are already building. I mean, we're also building uh, an ETH2 on top of substrate. And we're like, so we, we get all the basics from substrate, but then the runtime itself is where ETH2 that's lives. Right. Yeah. But in, in these like ETH2 runtimes, they deploy to shards they will need some sort of framework or some sort of tooling on like how you how you build them and like this is all super early so i don't know if anyone has actually started looking at how to build them and you know what it is I mean, what i've seen from the ewasm team who works a lot on this is just handwritten webassembly code and um uh, like there will be languages and tools and like frameworks and all of this stuff to build that as well uh so i think the sdk you know, world of ETH2 is more around how you do, how you build these runtimes, but not a, a whole chain because you would never need to do that. Right. And the shards are all going to be the same from a protocol standpoint. So there's no need to make like, you know, like m implement different shards in, in different ways. I see. I wanted to go back to hear a little bit more about what you guys are up to and what what is prismatic labs today prismatic labs today actually last time we spoke uh we actually were still working on it at a mostly at a part-time capacity uh now we have most of the team on a full-time capacity um and we we have four full-time folks and two part-time folks among, uh, uh, alongside all of our other open source contributors so prismatic labs aims to be you know kind of a, a leading implementer for uh, a major client for E2.0. We want to continue supporting the community. Our goal is to take this to production, deploy it to the real world, and beyond that, continue supporting the whole Ethereum effort, right? We, I mean, we're not going to stop until kind of phase two and the future is out. And beyond that, we're still going to be building things on top of E2. Um, I think eventually, you know, it will be really robust to build scalable applications. Um, and we might even transition into an application side team at that point. Mm. 
um, at the moment, we just really want to get this out to the world and make it happen. And that's that's actually sort of another question I had, which is like, back when we spoke to you last year, you had received this grant. How are you funding yourselves today? Yeah, we've been we've been very generally generously supported by the Ethereum Foundation uh, grant program, alongside other grants. Uh, currently, we have enough runtime kind of to make it uh, to production, um, and ideally, we want to scale the team even more. So, as time goes on, hopefully, we can you know either receive more grants and scale the team even even higher. Um, yeah, so that's that's essentially our focus at the moment. Um, we're fortunately not distracted by kind of uh, kind of. Kind of other uh, kind of revenue uh, revenue opportunities at the moment. Um, we have enough to sustain ourselves and build this out. So were you guys yeah. were you guys one of the people who received one of the Vitalik grants? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we did receive that. Was that, that to was, everyone, that or just shocker. for some reason I thought that went straight to Preston, but I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it went to, it went to our uh, our multi sig wallet. Okay. So it was a few folks that received that. I think it was just like a very 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 cool, very unexpected. But yeah. Do you have a, like, you kind of mentioned a little bit, you're, you're looking to the future, but are you guys thinking about that? Because, you know, we talk, we've talked about this yeah. throughout many episodes over the year about being dependent on grants or donations or what have you, but that's not a business model in a way that's not Absolutely, sustainable. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that right now might not be the time you have to think about it, but ha like, have you started to think of any sort of business model or any way yeah, to continue? Yeah, it? we have actually. It, it turns out that a lot of the opportunities that come along actually for us in particular are past the production release of phase zero and maybe starting on phase one. Uh, there are revenue opportunities once that, that's in mainnet. So we have been thinking about that. Um, I think we'll be able to just really dedicate more time to that post a production release. Cool. So yeah, I think there are opportunities. We do ideally want to stick around the E2 world and want to want to just keep contributing heavily to Ethereum and find opportunities there. Um, like I said, I mean, eventually we might even build on the application side of E2 once uh, smart contracts are live. Mm. Uh, when, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question that I'm sure you don't have an answer to, but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, sure. when, when ETH 2.0? When ETH 2.0? Um, yeah, I'll give you the... the I'll give you the uh, Kind of the re what I think is is going to happen is so we're going to have a multi client testnet by DevCon. I think uh, the January third date might be a little bit too ambitious, to be honest. Um, we're going to need a lot of testing around that multi client testnet. Like we're going to have to find a lot of bugs, fix a lot of things, optimize things, build out some tooling. Uh, before mainnet, I'm sure there's going to be need to be a lot more standardization of the cryptography, which is BLS that we use for you know hardware manufacturers and hardware wallet manufacturers to be able to build that out. I'm sure people will need those things before they can really stake, um, especially institutions, right? So, uh, you know, I think everything should be ready to go by Q1 of, of this upcoming year. Um, don't know exactly when in Q1 it will release, but there is a lot to be done in between, so yeah. But that's phase zero, right? That's phase zero, yeah. that's right. Phase one, the idea, I, I believe the research team wants to actually spec freeze phase one by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. What that means is that at that point, you know, the phase one implementation effort can go full force in parallel with the release of production phase zero. Um, I imagine that phase two will likely be spec frozen by Q1 or end of Q1 of next year. So I think uh, I think next year is going to be a really big year for production releases. We might see phase one production release uh, next year. Uh, we might see phase two production release early 2021. Um, these are just kind of kind of guesses based on our previous work and and experiences. So then, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. Yeah, thank you, Anna and Frederick. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.